Charville, and I'm a business development director with Charles River. I've been with the company, I think I'm going on 18 years this month. Um, and uh, my primary job responsibilities are, are working with clients in the New England area, biotech and pharmaceutical clients, helping them to get the answers to questions they have and help them through the drug discovery and development process from a business side of things. So I work a lot with contract negotiation, proposal development, um, any sort of uh, legal type of paperwork that needs to be put in place. And I work in very close collaboration with uh, a numerous amount of scientists, um, one of which is uh, joining me here today, Sam Schwang, and he'll introduce himself a little bit more um, after a few slides, but I just wanted to first give you a, a super brief overview of Charles River and what it is we're all about. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide. So for those of you that are not familiar with Charles River, we are a global contract research organization, and we are here to support our clients through essentially every step of the drug discovery and development process. Um, from uh, obtaining your early research models, uh, the actual animal models that you're gonna be using for experiments in-house um, through to uh, discovery capabilities such as uh, medicinal chemistry, candidate selection, efficacy of your compound, um, through GLP, safety assessment, all your toxicology work that you need to run, and then even helping in terms of clinical and manufacturing support. So Charles River really spans the gamut of um, essentially everything that you're going to need to take your compounds from the bench into humans. Um, next slide. And this just gives you an overview. We call this our subway map. Um, it gives you an overview of the real end-to-end -end drug discovery and development continuum that we offer at Charles River. So we're able to help you along every stop along this map. Um, so it's, it's a wide variety of services that we offer, um, meaning that we're able to help clients, uh, regardless of where they are in their, their discovery and development pipeline, um, we work on all types of therapeutic areas of, of molecules, um, all types of new molecules, small, large cell gene therapy, anything new that's, that's coming out, um, we're able to, to support our clients' efforts um, in, in bringing therapies to the world. Um, and this just gives you an overview of the types of compounds that we worked on. Um, Turtles River has worked on 85% of the drugs approved by the FDA in 2019. So it's, it's a really big number. And then on top of that, you know, we've worked on so much more that doesn't get approved by the FDA. So we have a really deep well of experience at Turtles River. Um, and uh, with that being said, I think Sam, do you want to go next? Talking about experience and so I'll just talk sure. about no. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, th this is a great roadmap showing the, the major areas of uh, drug development research and where uh, client uh, companies have been focused on in developing drugs. And, and this is just a nice synopsis of how much we've been involved in, um, you know, with 100% coverage of approved drugs in neurology and musculoskeletal musculoskeletal uh, diseases, uh, a huge percentage on oncology. And so, you know, it's really for us, for Jessica and I to really share the capabilities that we have, as well as our expertise to help drug companies really leverage what they're trying to do and get those promising drugs as quickly to market as possible. And this is a, a, a nice pictorial that I like to use. Um, in defining uh, the, the general overview of drug development, starting from target identify, identification in basic research, and then looking for compounds that interact with that target to modulate its function such that it has the ability to have that beneficial effect. And then going through the regulated safety testing and development stage and human clinical trials, and hopefully getting it to market. Um, I'll, I'll pause here before I start talking about drug discovery, a um, uh, little bit about myself. I've been in uh, drug development for uh, about 20 years now, uh, working on small and large uh, molecule programs, as well as cell gene therapies, vaccines, um, 
oligonucleotides uh, across a wide variety of different uh, uh, therapeutic indications. And I help work on developing these strategies from as early as target validation and drug discovery, all the way through to pre-market from a regulatory non um, and a scientific approach. And to, so today's presentation is really going to be focused on a very high level overview of drug discovery and strategies leading into a IND enabling program to get your drug into the clinic. Um, on each slide, I could probably talk for about a week about all the different nuances. And uh, today I'm not going to take all that much time. And what I hope to achieve is just give you a flavoring of some of the things to consider when you are considering going into drug development. And there are some really great strategies and, and some words of wisdom that I would like to share when you're entering in that, that can help you save time, money, and effort. And so uh, this pictorial is again, the same as the first pictorial about the drug development pathway, but showing a little bit different. This is kind of an example of a small molecule program where in basic research, Many companies start with uh, a library of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and I've known companies that have started in the millions, screening for those ideal candidates that interact with that target. And as you go through the drug discovery phase, you're, you're rapidly whittling down the number of viable candidates to a handful. And hopefully that you identify a few candidates that will go into the preclinical stage, and then to the expense of clinical testing in human patients. And this can be a long iterative process taking on average eight years and can cost as much as $2.6 billion uh, from start to the end taking into account failures. So if you can imagine, it's a very arduous journey to get to one FDA approved medicine. And the key thing about it is that there's no guarantee of success. You could fail at any stage. So then you think, why do we go through all this? Well, we go through it because we want to get great medicines into the market. But there are ways to try to increase your chances of success. And that's what I hope to share today. Jessica had presented the, the subway map of our service offerings and things that may be involved in your uh, drug development journey. And the more things that you use gives you more information that can help educate whether you go forward or go backwards. And one of the key things that I like to share that is that in this subway map, every program will have unique steps. You will use some of these, some of these will be common, and some will be unique to your program. But in selecting, well, which steps do I need to use? Which activities do I need to use? I, I like to keep three major principles in mind when you're developing that strategy. And they are to help you avoid the major causes of failure of drugs in the drug development process. These are the lack of exposure in the clinic. You're not getting enough drug to the target tissues to have a beneficial effect. You may have the lack of efficacy. So you think you've hit the mechanism or a pathway, but it actually doesn't translate to clinical benefit. And then of course, there may be due to overt toxicity. You're, you're, the toxicity profile of your drug given at an efficacious level may be too dangerous to be able to give to patients safely. And so we try to use various different tests and then activities and studies to help minimize um, the reasons why a drug may fail and heighten your chances of success to getting it into the market. This is kind of a flow map that our discovery colleagues use to highlight some of the key activities that you may employ in the drug discovery process. You know, you may use a lot of uh, cell lines and um, discovery and research and structural biology and protein production to be able to identify a suitable target. And then you will use tests uh, of assays to see if you can actually manipulate a particular pathway to the, to the benefit of uh, the drug or target ther therapeutic indication you may be using. And you may use um, 
advanced technologies like CRISPR to identify or create a pharmacology model uh, and have target expression so that you can screen for the drugs that will work, as well as using bioinformatics in a multiple different ways. I think that when we think about AI and how it's really revolutionizing virtually every major part of our global economy, whereas how we pay for things with credit cards, market analysis, well, drug discovery is no different. We're leveraging AI and using bioinformatics and screening for potential ideal new targets, screening for ideal structures, as well as looking for biomarkers that can be indicators of clinical success. Then we start moving towards more translational approach where we actually have identified a target. Now we wanna make sure that it is uh, a viable way to create a drug uh, that will be effective in treating a patient for a particular uh, mechanism of action. And that's through the hit identification, screening of compounds or proteins, and then narrowing it down through uh, looking at different parts of characteristics, which I will go into in a moment, uh, to be able to have a, a drug candidate that has the ideal properties. And then utilizing uh, cell-based assays, biomarkers, and in vivo pharmacology uh, models to really give you that confidence that yes, not only am I finding a good drug that interacts with my target protein, but I'm gonna actually have a predictor by which we think that it's gonna have clinical benefit. So now I'm gonna talk about small molecule development. And in this part, I'm just gonna have a high overview of some of the major things that I would consider in a successful small molecule program. One of the key things is the screening criteria about building an ideal profile of your small molecule candidate. And you will be taking into account pharmacological properties. Does it have high affinity? Does it bind tightly to your protein or your target? Does it have that uh, beneficial functional effect on the protein or pathway? Sometimes you want it to have high affinity. Sometimes you want it to have mild affinity. It depends on the indication and the properties of that particular function, which you want to modulate. Sometimes you want to inhibit, sometimes you want to stimulate. And so these things are, are very important factors when you talk about how you want the drug to interact with your target. Then of course, there's uh, biochemical properties. You wanna have a stable molecule, that's not fragile, that can last a while. Uh, you want to be able to synthesize it in a repetitive way that's reproducible with high quality and purity, and also not to have a, a problematic synthesis. Many compounds can be created, but when you actually start trying to create and manufacture it in larger scales, this could be a rate limiting step. It makes a big difference if your chemical uh, synthesis process goes from using intermediates to have a three-step process versus a 15-step process. Your costs become exponential such that that drug, while it may be beneficial, economically it may not be feasible to develop. And then, of course, we look at its pharmacokinetics. We want to have an ideal profile of how long it lasts in the body so that it can have its therapeutic effect. And then we counterbalance with its uh, prop binding properties with its safety and toxicity because compounds will have a um, side toxicity that we want to characterize to safeguard human patients and avoid some of the major hurdles that have um, stopped uh, previous drug programs uh, from advancing further. Um, one of the things that I mentioned was uh, AI and how it dri it's been driving drug discovery. A lot of companies now are focusing and utilizing and using computational analysis, as you can see from this uh, nice little video, where they can theoretically look at different compounds of different structures and look from a physical chemical point of view, how does it fit in a potential binding market? And being able to do the modeling, it narrows down the number of compounds that you'd want to advance to physically test and characterize. So it helps speed up the process of identifying potentially good 
structures by which you can build upon. This is an example of a list of uh, really ideal uh, chemical properties of a small molecule that you would want to have and to create kind of a decision tree and rate compounds with each other. If you're looking for the best in class of every single one, you will never find that molecule. That you would want to look for ones that have the overall best profile and then set criteria limits on each one of these where you say it must have a minimum X factor or property for it to go further. And then it could be a little bit lower, but it has ideal problems on, on the other factors. And that's how you are able to kind of keep bring up a decision tree and be able to rank your compounds and decide which ones are the strongest candidates to invest time and effort into. ADME is a very important um, aspect of drug development. Uh, ADME stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And essentially what it means is you're really studying the way a drug is absorbed into a body, the, where it goes in the body, and then how is it disposed of by the body. And understanding things, uh, these elements can help you also in the decision tree. Um, some drugs may be highly uh, soluble and maybe ideal oral drug, and some are very hard and you may have to create suspension. Or some are very, uh, have properties where it is actively transported out of the body. So oral absorption is not possible. So then you have to deliver that drug IV. Other things that we have to look into are things like drug-drug interactions. And they can play an important role, especially when patients have um, a, uh, that you're, you're enrolling into clinical trials may already be on such a standard of care medicines. And so what we do is we look at the major uh, cytochrome P450 enzymes that break down uh, enzymes as well as chemicals in the body, and we look for your drug candidate's ability to inhibit that property, to increase the activity of that property, or be a substrate of it. In these situations, you're able then to contrast to the profile of what are known drugs that are already on the market and look at patients, whether they're taking those medications and, if, and, and avoid any strong contraindications, that is drugs that don't work well together you might inadvertently increase the toxicity of one, you might inadvertently uh, decrease the activity of another. And so in understanding that ahead of time will also help you in the candidate selection process. Now I'd like to share a case study where this company approached me about wanting to perform GOP studies. Um, in our call, they have told us they've done a lot of great work, which they did. They did in vitro efficacy studies showing great beneficial properties. They did in vivo pharmacology studies um, to show in vivo modeling that it, was, that it would have a clinical benefit. Um, they did PK studies in rats and dogs. They did already the acute uh, single dose toxicity studies. So they already understood um, some of the highest levels that they could test in rats and dogs. And they even performed two week repeat dose studies. Now they're ready to go into the GLP studies because they felt they had a, uh, a complete body of work. But in our discussions, we talked about uh, the in vitro ADME work, uh, looking at identification of in vitro metabolites. And, and what that means is that we would compare human breakdown products of the drug and ensure that the tox species that we're using have generation of the same human metabolites because these metabolites have their own intrinsic properties as well as toxicities. And in an in vivo setting, we want to take into account all the potential effects that could happen to a human patient. So we perform that work for them before starting the GLP studies and lo and behold, the dog lacked the metabolism 
um, of one major metabolite that is produced in humans, which meant that all the dog work they had done was for naught. We could not use the dog in the ID enabling studies. We had to select a different non rodent species to uh, support their entry into clinical trials. So not only did they lose all this data, they also lost time and uh, money. So this was a, a, an exercise by which doing careful planning, doing this, some of the more basic work and characterization could help them have avoided this uh, dilemma. When we're looking at the maximizing the uh, potential efficacy, we really look at the Aviva efficacy in pharmacology models, and then looking, contrasting that to toxicity, making sure that we are able to properly characterize it. And there are a lot of factors other than just running these studies that need to be taken into account. Formulation de uh, development is really important. I'll give you two examples on that. For oral formulation, if you take it and it's low bioavailability, that means you have to give a lot more of the drug in order to get exposure. And that's a waste of drug when you could have formulated something that helps increase the bioavailability of the drug, i.e. it allows it to go in to systemically from the gut to the blood systems to get to the target tissues. Also, in an IV, you may have used something that could be uh, in the vehicle components that either has a, uh, the wrong pH level or could, could contain an excipient that is irritating. And that could actually cause complications such that you're not looking at toxicities of your drug, but you're having complications from the vehicle itself. So formulation development can play a very important role and should be done ahead of in vivo studies. Selection of the dose right is really important to make sure that, the, again, the drug reaches the target tissue. And so what we try to do is try to mimic as close as possible, what would you use in the human setting? And how that drug reaches there, again, with formulation development, looking at absorption through the gut, you may or may not be able to use oral tablets or capsules, you may have to do an IV. Then, of course, the characterization of the pharmacokinetics is really important because this is where we want to see how long the, the drug lasts in the body. You may be, if it's short acting, you may want short acting, but if you want to have only daily dosing versus three times dosing for constant exposure, choosing the right drug may help you uh, select one candidate over another. When we think about oral formulation development, there are a lot of different factors come in. And this is the slide is just to highlight that. I'm not gonna go through it, but as you can see, there's a number of different avenues by which you can take for formulation development. And depending on the class of uh, classification, you will be able to uh, designate where to go in your formulation pathways. Other dosage routes can play an important role and there are different factors that come into it. For a topical application, um, you will a formulation, you may have to do UV absorption uh, or phototoxicity assays. Um, you also use different components in the uh, vehicle that you would use. Inhalation has a completely different route where you'd have to do a lot of calculations on dispersal the method of the actual delivery of it. Are you gonna crush a tab tablet or is it gonna be a spray format? A lot of things come into effect that you'd have to uh, do additional work in order to be able to um, uh, get into the clinical trials. As I mentioned before, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics PD are important aspects. And these two are not the same thing. Pharmacokinetics is really the measure of how much drug is in the body. And pharmacodynamics is how long does the drug have that beneficial effect that you're looking for. For, for drugs that inhibit, the PK and the PD um, curves will look very similar. But for something that's say a stimulatory, the, the PD effects may last much longer than when the presence of your drug. 
And so careful understanding characterization of these two uh, important uh, characteristics of your drug is really important in uh, determining uh, whether you have a viable program or not. So one of the things about doing these studies for a drug is really it helps predict dosing. How are you gonna dose? How often you're gonna dose? How much is going to, of your drug is gonna be exposed to help guide the clinical trial design? Then you'll also be able to understand some of the variability between individuals. Um, for examples, if your oral formulation gives variable results in the rodent species where you see some animals have high absorption, some have low absorption, they might help interpret what's going on in the clinic. Then it also can be used to help establish a therapeutic window. Oftentimes you need a minimum concentration to have the beneficial effect. And systemically you can monitor how long does a drug stay systemically above that, that, that threshold to have its beneficial effect. And that can help also with those, uh, how often you have to dose the patient. Now, after doing all that, why do drugs still fail in the clinic? We do all this type of work and there are other factors that come into play. Uh, and we also, we do specialized uh, studies to help again, try to minimize that. As you can see from the graph to the right, you have a lot of candidates that are entering on, have been successful in being nominated as a candidate, but then as you go through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, more and more um, drugs and are being terminated because they fail for one reason or another. So what we need to do is continually refine those uh, methods and, and data gathering in the early stages to help prevent this and minimize failure as much as possible. And so in the screenings, you have early lead optimization and late, optimi late lead optimization. And as you are narrowing your candidate pool, you will invest more time and effort in characterizing and hopefully build the ability to avoid some major liabilities like cardiovascular effects causing arrhythmias or QT prolongation, which can be a, a, an important, uh, it's a critical uh, toxicity that's sometimes not seen until you go into the clinic. Well, there are now tests that we can do to help you mitigate that potential liability. In the early lead optimization, we'll focus on screening a lot of compounds, and so you wanna go through, through this very quickly and minimally. And then as you narrow down to a small handful or one candidate, you go into more in-depth evaluation and characterization of the drug. Now I'm gonna switch our attention to small molecule for the last half of this presentation. And what do I mean by a biologic? Well, it's typically a protein or a peptide that's used or intended as a therapeutic to have, med have claimed medical benefits to the patients taking it. And these can also include blood substitutes and vaccines. In the old days, it also included um, cell and gene therapies, but through the evolution of drug development, um, biologics in this terminology are now reviewed by the Center of Drug and Evaluation um, Research, so CEDAR. And CBER, would be being biologics, are focused on cell and gene therapies, uh, more of the cutting edge where there's no real standardized roadmap to get into the clinic. In today's talk, I'll be mainly focusing on antibodies primarily, and well, as well as protein constructs that have antibody components. And, and then at the very, very end, I'll talk a little bit on cell and gene therapies and how they are unique compared to small molecule and large molecule development. So you saw this uh, same graph, uh, table before for small molecules. And I'm highlighting the two uh, differences. You can see that the properties are, are basically the same, but the, the key differences between a large and small molecule is that in the physical 
properties of a small molecule, you're looking at solubility, stability. Here for proteins, we're looking for that stable protein that stays in its native conformation and also the generation of a high production cell line. So cell lines that produce high amounts of your desired therapeutic. And then in safety to and toxicity, so we're looking for a high safety margin and we have to take into account the potential for immunotoxicity. That is a patient's immune systems rejecting the protein or biologic drug. So they can create an immune response such that it negates it, clears it, or it can cause a serious adverse effect that like you may have heard in the news, like cytokine storms, uh, highs, interactions, hypersensitivity. So we try to safeguard uh, and uh, characterize that with uh, protein biologics. The challenges in antibody development are a little bit unique from small molecules. Uh, one of the key things that we try to safeguard is making sure that there's not uh, off-target off binding of antigens on healthy cells. That's particularly true with oncology drugs. We're also looking for um, safeguarding for toxicities that may be caused by binding onto the surface antigens that cause them to shed into the circulation and having secondary effects. There are other limitations because sometimes certain biologics can't cross the blood brain barrier or it cannot reach a particular target in a tissue. Then of course, we have to look out for unwanted stimulation of the immune response as I mentioned before. The other aspect of antibody development is that it is more expensive than small molecules. We may need to use less number of studies, but these studies are more intricate in their design and also become more expensive in the uh, methodologies that are needed to support those studies. When we look, think about lead identification, things to look at and to consider are the form. So sometimes we uh, sorry for that. Sometimes we are looking at traditional monoclonal antibody, but now with the advancements of protein engineering, we can use the key elements that are desirable, remove the other parts, and then create novel protein structures by which we can have single domains, chain of different domains, linking of bispecific or tri-specifics, recognizing three different antigens to create a unique um, biological effect by which the patients can um, have that clinical benefit. And so the creativity here is amazing and it's almost unlimited in the number of, of uh, protein constructs that you can create. And you just have to imagine it and put it together and then test it to see if it is gonna be efficacious and safe. Hey, Sam. Yes. I got a question from a participant. Should I ask sure. you now or do yeah. you prefer if I wait to the end? Okay. No, no. Um, someone was wondering if peptide drugs are considered safer than antibodies, aka large proteins. It's a great question. In some ways, yes. So peptides may not trigger the immune system. Antibodies have FC receptors that can interact with uh, the FC receptor or T cell receptors. And alcohol also can interact with complement. Peptides are smaller. They, they can be, sometimes they can be, um, don't last in the body as long. So as you know, monoclonal antibodies can stay in the, in the body for months. And that is sometimes a desirable thing. Sometimes it's not, depending on your target and what you want to use it in the clinic. So if you need something that's fast acting, but then, then only use as needed, then a peptide could be really useful for that. And plus, because of its size, it's also easier to manufacture. So there's a lot of great advantages from that perspective. Great question, thank you. Uh, coming on to the ideal candidate, we want high affinity to the target, low non-specific binding, as I mentioned before, and a couple other things. And I also mentioned it, low immunogenicity, uh, low reactions to the immune system. But some other things that are, are, are interesting for proteins 
our thermal stability? Does it stay in its native conformation by which it's active? As you know, sometimes they can fall out of conformation and then be inactive or denatured and, and not work at all. Cross species targeting can be a benefit because then you can actually have relevant talk species to characterize it, which helps you have um, safety information for when you go into the clinical trials. PN says, pH sensitization is really important because there can be fluctuations in different environments and the protein may be activated in certain environments like an acidic environment or it may not be. And so understanding the uh, pH sensitivity is important. And of course, we want to have aggregation resistance. And what that means, we don't want proteins to clump together. If they're clumped together, then they one can become physical blockages but they also can attract unwanted uh, uh, clotting as well as become ineffective because they can no longer engage the targets. So other considerations uh, are biomarkers. And I think especially in the last five, 10 years, this has become more and more important role. I think you'll be in clinical trials in the early days, they look for the standard uh, clinical endpoints. And those are very sometimes very hard to achieve, especially for chronic diseases. The use of identifying biomarkers and disease markers are really helpful because it can help safeguard patient safety by having early signs of toxicity. You can have bio, uh, disease biomarkers that can help you have early signs of efficacy. And a lot of more intricate clinical trials now are seeing you leveraging these biomarkers by which they can go further into the clinic, gain further chances of calling a trial successful by having these biomarkers in sometimes in replacement of the traditional uh, endpoints that could be very difficult to achieve. Now I'm gonna go into um, preclinical strategy. So this is irrespective of small molecule, large molecule, what is the overall strategies when you're going into drug development? This is a very simplistic um, graph that I put together, having costs over time, and the three major activities, preclinical studies or non-clinical studies, clinical trials, as well as manufacturing of the drug. And as you're moving from one stage to the next stage, drug discovery, preclinical, clinical trials, you see that different activities have different pricing requirements, cost requirements, and they change as the program evolves or progresses, and also becomes a far more expensive as you move down the chain closer to uh, getting into the clinic. One of the key things about it is, of course, as I mentioned before, you'll see that now I give you a different range. Instead of an average of 2.6, the broad range is around 700 million to as high as $5.3 billion that needs to be spent to get a drug into market. And no guaranteed success. That's the risk that people take in it. So really careful consideration and trying to optimize is really important. And one of the key things that contributes to this is that bottom line, time. We want to save as much time, get into the clinic as fast as possible. And so careful planning is really needed. This is a sample um, markup of how much drug you need to get from one point to another. And this is from a, a generic small molecule drug you may need to get into phase one clinical trials and support for phase one clinical trials, about 6.7 kilograms of material. For very, very potent material, you may need far less. For things that are quote, oh, I have a great drug and it's super safe, you may need 20, 30 kilograms of material to get to the same stage. So it's a double-edged sword when you say, I have a very safe uh, drug. If you need a lot of it, then you're gonna to have to produce a lot in order to support all the work that's needed. Another factor that comes in, of course, is money. The amount for just the preclinical pre package, not including how much it costs to manufacture, 
is between one or two million dollars. If you're doing a biologic, it could be two to four million dollars. If it's a, so, there's a lot of different variables that come into play, and so really it depends on the complexity of the program. And what we try to do is give you everything that you need, just enough to satisfy the regulatory agencies. Anything else that's good to have, you're kind of wasting money unless it's purposeful for something else. And that sometimes it can be a strategy, but for the most part, you really want to try to be mindful of how much things cost and how much material you need. This is a Gantt chart of a typical small molecule. I'm not going to go through all the little lines. I just want you to have an appreciation that each of these uh, blocks represent months. And of course, up to 27 months, that's basically two years. You can have a lot of work that's being done, a week, sorry. And you can have a lot of work done in parallel. So careful planning of what can be in parallel and what has to be sequential, like the dose range finding studies at the top part will lead to having that data going to contribute to the design of the 28 day studies. Staggering them this way, you can save time. When we look at a submission to the FDA to go into clinical, into human clinical trials, there's three main components. Clinical trial protocol, CMC or chemistry manufacturing controls, and the pharmacology toxicology package. Mo many people will work on these and tackle them independently because they're very different from each other. My message to you is that they're all interrelated and you have to think about them all at the same time because they all have implications with each other. For the CMC portion, it's really meant to highlight exactly what is the drug, how do you manufacture it, can you manufacture reproducibility, reproducibility, reliably, as well as identifying the proper strength, quality. Um, and this feeds into how quickly you can manufacture enough in order to support the studies that need to consume the product, as well as the clinical trials. Here's a case study that I like to share about committing before planning. This is a small little company that came out of a university. The CEO was a former professor that discovered and developed this antibody. And they brought in as part of the lean uh, management team a CFO. And he only had a uh, finance background. Um, the professor, she had the science, but it was all academic science. They created a board. They went, they said, here's the plan. Here we're gonna go, the board of directors approve their timeline, 15 months timeline. Now comes the wrinkle. They come to us and I say, okay, where are you at? Well, the current status is that the protein expression is only at the transient cell line stage. So they have not created a permanent cell line which they can reliably produce protein from. They were doing this within, with transient transfections, produce a little bit amount of it, and they have to repeat it. So there's no reliable manufacturing. When they actually were told what the cell line development means and why it's needed, then they look into that, into what time would it be taken to, to be able to accomplish that. For cell line development, just to schedule the project into a CMO's timelines was three to five months. The cell line development was three to five months. The protein production after establishing the cell line was another four to six months. And that's if nothing went wrong, which we know there's always something that happens. And then on top of that, now you finally have enough material for your toxicology program, which takes 12 months to do. So they promised and got approved 15 month timeline. And it is impossible to squeeze 22 to 28 months worth of work that is linear into the timelines. So they promised something before actually doing the due diligence and they had thought, oh, I just go into talks, not thinking about CMC. Clinical trials, they are meant to be highly um, designed so that FDA can actually review what's gonna be done, what's the patient enrollment, how are they gonna be dosed, how are they gonna be monitored? One of the key things about the clinical trial design 
is that it is critical to know this before building your uh, toxicology program. It has to come first. The toxicology program, if properly put together, is to complement and provide the necessary information to the clinical trial. And this is highlighted in the ICHM3 guidelines that dictates what's needed for that trial. And here's the, here's the table. You basically have to match your clinical duration with your toxicology studies. Now I'm gonna give a quick case study on this. Apples versus oranges. So I had this client come to me and I developed their program. And in the program, the IND enabling study was four doses given weekly with followed by a four week recovery period. The four dose groups was one control with three test uh, article dose groups. And so this is what their clinical trial design was. And this is what we put together and everything ran smoothly. Got beautiful data out of it. No issues with study conduct and ready to file for the IND. However, during the time that we were running the studies, the clinician changed phase 1B. Phase 1A stayed the same, single ascending dose. But phase 1B, instead of giving the patients a dose once weekly, no, I'm going to give the same four doses, but I'm going to give it once monthly. So when they went to the FDA, what happened? They got approved for phase 1A and put clinical hold on phase 1B because the Patient exposure is now four months, not four weeks. And so they would now have to go back and rerun a toxicology program to be able to support this. So they basically caused themselves greater than one year delay. It was a very costly mistake for them. For the toxicology programs, we developed these ID enabling studies to, to achieve the following goals. It's the data is going to be used for estimating a safe starting dose in clinical trials, maybe potential, identify potential biomarkers, and we've discussed the importance of that, identify potential target organs for toxicities, and then the recovery period is to assess when we do see it, because we expect to see it so we can characterize it, how reversible are they? And then leveraging all this, this data, what is the margin of safety? And then prior to registration, so after you get into the first and the clinical trials, you have additional studies to do, which are toxicology studies, repro studies, if applicable, if you're going to be um, dosing uh, women of childbearing age, and of course, carcinogenic potential. We don't want to give drugs that could cause cancer. One of the key things about these studies is they have to be performed under GLP good laboratory practices, and these are to safeguard the reliability of the, of the data. And so this is sometimes, some people say, well, this is a study I could do in my own lab, but with all the safeguards you need, with all the documentation, with all the rigors that you have to do, it, that's the reason why it needs to be done in a GOP compliant manner. Otherwise, the FDA will refuse to acknowledge the data. So because there's an added expense to it, there are some studies that need to be GLP and some that don't. We definitely want to differentiate the two to save money as much as possible and save that for more uh, purposeful activities like support of GLP talk studies. And this is a listing of, the, of this. I'm not going to go through this. Um, after this, uh, Jessica will be able to share a copy of this presentation. You have the recordings. Uh, so that you'll have access to this data. Another new, fairly recent requirement that the FDA has posed is SEND requirements. And what is SEND? SEND is the electronic data packaging of numerical data as well as pathology data so that they receive it and they can make independent reviews of the data rather than simply re relying on the interpretation that's presented in the IND application. The other aspect of it is that they also create larger databases by which they can refer across different classes of compounds or, or similar drugs in the same therapeutic indication to look for key findings that they need to look at. And for the benefits of industry, they, we can also leverage the same kind of data analysis and harmonize approach. 
Lastly, I really want to go into the growing number of different drugs. Um, we have now, research has really exploded to have uh, new advanced therapies, modifying cells to have activated T cells or uh, insertions of, of genes that can then express missing proteins, gene therapies to permanently edit patients' DNA, uh, oncolytic viruses for cancer, and then, as I mentioned before, different constructs using different uh, parts of antibodies have become in a more important role. Uh, with oligonucleotides, this is uh, amino acids, be, uh, sorry, uh, this is DNA or RNA being spliced together. There are a number of different formats by which we can use it either to express a protein like some of the uh, vaccines that are out there like Moderna and Pfizer, um, or they can be used for rare orphan diseases. And so these take a different approach in regulatory guidelines. And here I've listed the different um, common things to think about how they're looked at. For small oligonucleotides, they're often look, uh, viewed as small molecules. And so CDER will be the one center of drug evaluation and research. They're the ones that will be uh, evaluating those programs. But for longer ones like messenger RNAs, like uh, the products that Moderna produces, that's done by CBER in the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies. Still, uh, stem cell and cellular th therapy products are unique in the sense that we take patient cells or all, uh, um, other cells from humans and then be able to manipulate them to have new features to replace um, defective cells in a patient. And so there are a number of different ways that uh, this is being leveraged. Uh, the mechanisms can be incorporation into a tissue or to help regenerate, start the regeneration process in an organ or tissue. And so um, this is a highlight of uh, stem cell therapies where it illustrates taking a patient's own um, blood, cell, um, blood cells, activate them in vitro or in, include them in uh, gene transfer by CRISPR technology, and then reintroduce them back into the patients or being able to culture them, select them for the desired CAR T cells or engineered cells and reintroduce them into the patient for therapy. Because these are so unique compared to large and small molecules, they have different questions that are, are um, though the same principles, they have different ways of being characterized for drug development. And this includes uh, the activities, what models to use, biodistribution is critically important, how long it lasts in the body is very important. And then uh, because they're so unique, uh, new guidelines have been developed and released uh, at the beginning of last year to specifically address the developments to give uh, companies, the uh, reliability of understanding what is needed in order to develop these in, in, uh, to go into the clinic. And one of the key things, one of the main messages of what makes it different is that for the cell gene therapies, it's not the product itself that you're really trying to safeguard. It's actually the process. The process of changing cells, the process of manipulating genes is the product. You're not you're actually changing the effects in the body, but it's not what you're actually delivering that makes those changes. And so that's a really important distinction. Overall, always refer to the guidelines that are relevant to your program, whether it be small molecule, large molecule, there could be therapeutic indications. I highly recommend you doing extensive research in this part. And I know I use that most of the time, but I like to conclude by saying that Charles River has an extensive uh, capabilities in supporting from all virtually all different aspects of drug development and that it takes careful planning for us to be able to uh, help deliver drugs as quickly as possible into the clinic and hopefully into the market. And the last thing I like to share uh, when you receive the PDF is that these are two stories on rare and orphan disease. And 
this is something that's really a remarkable breakthrough in drug development. We're now designing in real, in real life therapies for one. And these are the two avant-garde programs that have helped the FDA and biotech revolutionize how we evaluate the safety of potential therapies and getting them to the clinic rather than taking years, taking months. And so I like to conclude with that. And with whatever minutes that you can spare, I'd like to take any questions.